Hi, my name is Richard Tate. I'm a PhD candidate in interdisciplinary ecology here at the University of Florida. And I'm here today to talk to you about biocultural diversity in Europe. So you may be asking yourself, what is biocultural diversity in the first place? Well, we're gonna have to do a little explanation to talk about that. First, let's think about Europe. When you think about Europe, what comes to mind? Maybe it's the beautiful architecture in different cities, the landscape, such as this view from the Alps, the delicious food like French cuisine, German sausage, or Hungarian goulash. Perhaps it's the beautiful and exotic folk dances of the continent. But one thing that really comes to mind for me when I think about Europe is the great diversity in languages and people across the continent. So all these things, including as we'll see the landscape, speak to the cultural diversity of the European continent. So why is Europe so culturally diverse? Um, one main aspect of this is the geographic, geographical diversity of the continent. So um, from the Sami reindeer herding people here in the top left to the Greek fishermen in the Aegean Sea, the European landscapes provide a lot of different resources for people to utilize and form their lifestyles. Different opportunities for making a living, if you will. Um, so this biodiversity, which is a result of the geographic diversity of the continent, is reflected by this different cultural diversity, on ways people utilize the plants, animals, and climates that they live in. Another thing that has impacted the cultural diversity of Europe, of course, is the movement of peoples um, in the region um, from outside and within Europe as well. Um, this continues to this day. So we'll talk more about that a bit later. So let me give you one local example of the ties between nature and culture from here in Florida. The critter you see here, alligator mississippiensis, or the American alligator, is known for being a ferocious predator in local environments, uh, reputed for being strong, intense, and tenacious. Humans have taken these traits to represent their sports teams here at the University of Florida. Um, we're known as the Gators, for anybody who doesn't know. And so we try to represent the same aspects from this wild creature in our own sports teams. Um, so that's just one local example of how nature can influence culture in different contexts, even in the United States. So when we talk about biocultural diversity, what makes it up? Biocultural diversity is a combination of biological and cultural diversity, but it's much more than that. So it's about the relationships between nature and humans, um, the connections between them, knowledge that people have about local environments, um, plants and animals, and also the languages that they use to describe these relationships. So it takes up a variety of different, of different uh, aspects. Uh, Dr. Luis Amafi, who's one of the main proponents of this biocultural view and perspective, has described biocultural diversity as the true web of life. So usually when we talk about the web of life, we're talking about all the biological creatures, but if we expand that to include the human world and the relationships there, then you get a, a more accurate representation of the interactions between life and all its forms. And Dr. Luis Maffi actually is from Italy originally, so it's interesting that one of the main proponents of this viewpoint um, is from a European country. So how do we go about studying biocultural diversity and, and these different relationships? So because it's such a broad field in the study of human and nature cultural relations, um, we apply techniques from linguistics, so the language that we use to talk about these relationships, anthropology, um, ecology and botany, a variety of different things. Um, one of the main things that we're looking at is what's come to be known as traditional ecological knowledge or tech for short. Um, traditional ecological knowledge is the combined elements of all the, the ways that people 
have come to live in their different environments and the things they know about them and how to really thrive in different regions. So mountain regions to flatlands to the sea coast to the deserts. Um, main aspect of this knowledge that I'm very interested in, the things that I study, is uh, plant use knowledge or the ethnobotanical knowledge. Um, so ethno is from a root, um, like the same root that we get ethnic from. So peoples, different peoples, and botany, of course, is the study of plants. So examining how people are using plants in these different contexts to be source of medicine, food, and cultural um, associations. And this is a cultural universal, right? So everybody, all peoples around the world use plants to one degree or another, even folks living in polar regions have some use of the plants. Um, so it's, it's a very powerful way that we can compare and contrast different approaches to living with the natural world. So unfortunately, biocultural diversity, like our other diversities, are under threat. So of course we know about um, our biological species uh, undergoing extinctions, but this also happens with traditional knowledge and a big example you can see here and when we're talking about the biocultural context is language extinction. So there's about 6,000 languages currently being spoken in the world and um, some researchers posit that within the next 100 years about half those languages will no longer be actively spoken or have um, uh, first speakers or um, native speakers. So this is sort of an under acknowledged um, wave of extinction that's happening as well. And when these languages go, you also lose these cultural associations with the natural world. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this is happening. Some of it is um, industrial farming methods and economic changes are causing people to be displaced from their their um, environments that they develop this traditional knowledge in. So lack of incomes in some of these rural contexts are causing people to move to cities. And when people are removed from these environments and the plants and animals on which this traditional knowledge is based, these links of knowledge transmission are broken between generations. And so uh, much of this knowledge is in danger of being lost. Um, and one way that this can be helped is by acknowledging biocultural diversity and looking to its conservation in things like the European Union's common agricultural policy and other methods um, that can kind of help preserve the knowledge through policy instruments. So why should we care about biocultural diversity? Um, a big thing for me is that in this modern age, many people are concerned about sustainability and how we can live lives that are more in harmony with nature, if you will. And many of these traditional lifestyles and this traditional knowledge is based on environmental relations that are sustainable. And you can see this because people have survived for generations, and in some cases, hundreds and thousands of years in these environments, um, and actually promoted the biodiversity in these regions. So if you think about mountain contexts like the Alps, for example, um, high up people move their cows in the summer and the grazing of the cows helps to keep these very biodiverse mountain meadows open. And it's shown that when cows and these people are removed from these mountain environments, you start getting um, trees and shrubbery moving into the area and this blocks out sunlight, of course, and so you lose a lot of the biodiversity in these mountain contexts. Um, so if we can promote the biodiversity and the rural communities that rely on this biodiversity as well, we help to preserve this biocultural knowledge and diversity and also promote um, living things as well. Hope you enjoyed that today. Be sure to like and subscribe and check out the resources below for more information. Thanks a lot.